So we continue with our series for the month of August, which I like to call Unity Heritage Month because both of our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, were born in the month of August. So last week we focused on Myrtle Fillmore. She was born on August 6th, 1845, and today we're going to talk about Charles Fillmore. He was born on August 22nd, 1854 to Henry and Mary Fillmore. They lived on a, on a Chippewa Indian reservation near what is now St. Cloud, Minnesota. So Charles grew up out there on the, on the wild frontier. Minnesota wasn't even a state back then. It was Indian territory, as they called it. His parents ran a, a trading post there, so he saw, he saw trappers and traders and lots of Sioux and Chippewa Indians who lived there. And there's this, there's this story that everyone seems to like about how when Charles was around six months old, there was this band of roving Indians who basically kidnapped him while he was uh, alone with his mother at the trading post. They took him off somewhere, and then they brought him back the same day. He was, he was, he was unharmed. I don't know if they got more than they bargained for when they took him or what. Is that, anybody ever read that O. Henry story called The Ransom of Red Chief? If you, look it up if you get a chance. Um, but they brought him back unharmed. And in later years, whenever, whenever Charles was asked about it, he's quoted as saying this. He said, Such incidents made my early years romantic, but crude and unprofitable. <laughs> crude and unprofitable. I, I, I love it because it, it's spoken like the true capitalist and real estate speculator that he came to be. I can hear that. I can hear that in what he said there. Now, another thing, uh, something that he had in common with Myrtle Fillmore, they were, their, their, their backgrounds were just about as different as could be. He grew up without much formal education out there in the wild frontier. She grew up in Ohio and went to high school and college and everything. But the thing they had in common was they each had a health challenge. And uh, for Charles, when he was 10 years old, he broke his hip and he was out ice skating. And because of uh, the lack of any real medical care at the time, he ended up with a leg that was three inches shorter than the other. So at various times in his life, he would use crutches, a cane, and eventually he had a leg brace that he used so that he, he could get around. Uh, he never let it slow him down, um, as, as, as you'll see. Um, and as I mentioned, he didn't have much of a formal education. Uh, he was fortunate to have been uh, tutored by the mother of a, of a friend of his out there on the reservation, uh, so he got some he got some, uh, some, some homeschooling where he read uh, the classic Shakespeare and other books like that that she had around, but no formal education. And his parents weren't churchgoers. In fact, his father left the family when he was quite young and went off on his own and uh, essentially left them. So Charles was from a broken home. And uh, Charles once said that when he was younger, back in those young days, he didn't believe in Jesus Christ and he didn't want anything to do with formal religion. That kind of sets the stage for what happened later on because he didn't have any embedded theology. He didn't have a lot of preconceived indoctrination that needed to be undone before he could go on to uh, do what he did with the unity movement. Got a couple more pictures of him from his younger days here. That's actually a baby picture they have in the archives. I know it's kind of hard to see, but, but there he is. And then we have another one here probably 10 or 11 years old in that picture thereabouts and then he's a little bit older here probably in his early 20s or something like that and let's see I think we have a couple more yeah he's getting a little bit older there and then this is a picture it's him on the right and he's with uh, one of his uh, one of his real estate partners from uh, from later years and I think that's the last one for now is that right yeah so those are the early days for for Charles Fillmore um, when he left Minnesota, he held a bunch of different jobs. He was working as a printer's assistant for a while, um, drove a mule team, and he worked as a clerk in a freight office. And this was uh, all before he met uh, Myrtle Fillmore. He met her when she was teaching in Denison, Texas. And uh, after that, they landed in Kansas City. That was in 1885 uh, where they got married. And uh, I understand that Kansas City was a pretty interesting place back then. This would have been 
the last large city before you headed out on the wild frontier. So it was a rail hub, it was a cattle town, it was a, it was a fast growing place, which is probably what made it attractive to Charles Fillmore because as I mentioned, he was a real estate speculator. What they called them back then, they called them plungers. Hmm. Anybody ever hear that term? That was a new one to me. A plunger doesn't mean the same thing it does today. You know, the, the thing that you use in the toilet. A pl the word the word plunger means someone who is a gambler or is reckless with money. That's an interesting that that's an interesting thing to call him. But I guess that's what real estate speculation was like. You were basically gambling, um, and uh, that's what he did. So it was while they were in Kansas City that uh, Myrtle Fillmore had her battle with tuberculosis. And uh, we heard last week about how she took various classes, Christian science and other teachers, and she came up with her own process of prayer and meditation and affirmations that she used to uh, help with her healing, that eventually led to her healing. Now, now Charles, as you might imagine, he was, he was a, a, a commercial, cold, he was a, a hard-nosed businessman, and he was a skeptic, but he was watching. And uh, as he was watching, um, here's what he said. He said, I was in sympathy with Mrs. Fillmore's continued demonstrations. In fact, my interest became so pronounced that I neglected my real estate for the furtherance of what my commercial friends pronounced a fanatical delusion. So he was getting some peer pressure, right? They were... They were saying, uh, you know, quit wasting, your, quit, quit wasting your time on all of that nonsense. So Myrtle's working on healing, and Charles decides that he is going to try to demonstrate the existence of what he called indwelling spirit, the, the source of healing, of wisdom. He was studying different religions, he was uh, studying different philosophies, and like, like Myrtle, listening to different teachers. And he noticed that there were lots of contradictions. A lot of these teachers contradicted each other on, on, on key things. Um, and that bothered him. That bothered him. He figured that if there really was such a thing as the ground of being, indwelling spirit, God principle, then there had to be some consistency and there had to be a means of communicating or, as he put it, the whole thing was a fraud. So that's when he started his, his homegrown meditation practice that he called sitting in the silence or the silence. This is how he described it. I then commenced sitting in the silence every night at a certain hour and tried to get in touch with God. There was no enthusiasm about it, no soul desire, but cold, calculating business method. I was there on time every night and tried all conceivable ways to realize that my mind was in touch with the supreme mind. I kept at it month after month. Cold and calculating, right? There's that, there's that real estate plunger mentality again. Makes him sound kind of ruthless, uh, but it also made him tenacious, which is what it took. Uh, that's what it took, and, and, it, and it took several months. And it wasn't until after many months had passed that he started to notice that his dreams were becoming more vivid. Um, one of the dreams that he had was about a real estate transaction, about the details of a transaction that later, that later actually happened. So this started to convince him that there was this larger intelligence at work in the universe and that it all starts in the silence. You, know, you, you, might, you might say that, that Charles was one of the first explorers of human consciousness, using himself as the, as the test subject. And this is the moment of the, what he called the opening of his spiritual nature, or we might call it... Uh, his, his, his awakening experience, his aha moment like Myrtle Fillmore had. And it was all a do-it-yourself approach. He had to invent his own form of meditation because, think about it, you couldn't just run down to the local bookstore and pick up a copy of the uh, Complete Idiot's Guide to Meditation, which really exists now. You can you know, go to the bookstore, yep, there it is. 
but he had to do it himself without much guidance. So, so Charles, he was way ahead of his time. And you think about the popularity of mindfulness and meditation today. He was doing it back there in the, in the 1880s. It wasn't until the mid-1960s when it really started to, to become popular in this country. And for Charles and his students back then, it was a way of life. It was the foundation of it all. So from that point on, it was off to the races. He uh, went into his newfound passion with the same degree of, of, of diligence and passion that he put into the real estate business. He went full time writing, teaching based on their experience. Um, got a few more photos here from the archives during the later years. So he eventually decided to grow the beer that was so popular back in the 1800s. And then, uh, oh, this is Charles and Myrtle. Uh, Myrtle's on the right there. There's somebody at a typewriter there. That's at the old Unity offices. That's probably the early silent Unity offices way, way back when. And let's see what's next. Oh, this was, uh, that's Charles and Myrtle over there on the right. And they're attending a, um, a, a tent meeting revival in uh, uh, Colorado, I believe. Manitou Springs, Colorado. Let's see what else we have here. There he is on the right. He's playing golf. That's at Unity Village. They have a nine-hole golf course there, by the way, if you ever get back there. He's, uh, he's, uh, I can't tell what kind of club that is, but, uh, <laughs> okay, what do we got next? Ah, uh, yes, and then this is probably a picture. Hello, hello. <laughs> it doesn't go out when I turn. It goes out only when I turn, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> Christmas picture that, uh, uh, probably went out uh, with the, the Daily Word or some kind of a card from Silent Unity back then. So those are some more pictures from the archives of, uh, of Charles Fillmore and, uh, and Unity. And uh, when he got into it back in the 1880s, he had a lot of catching up to do because, again, his, his, his upbringing had no religious background, so he did a lot of studying. And he was into everything, as you might uh, imagine. Um, before Unity was Unity, there was this uh, publication that, uh, that he started called, uh, called Modern Thought, and I have a, have a copy of it up here from 1889. I don't expect you to be able to read that, but those are all of the different books, pamphlets, and publications that, uh, that they offered through Modern Thought that Charles would, would, would sell to you and send to you. It was kind of a mail order type business. You'll find books up there about yoga, Buddhism, Islam, Christian science, Swedenborg, the Rosicrucians, Egyptology. In fact, uh, there's even a book up there on Judaism by a Rabbi Schindler, which caught my eye. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was into everything, and, and frankly, you know, it, it, was, it was a bit of a mess. It was a bit of a mess. It would be kind of like getting a Bloody Mary that looks like this. Have you seen the, Have you all seen the garnishing contests for Bloody Marys? I swear this is a thing. And, and, this, and this one won the prize, apparently, because this Bloody Mary, for those of you who can't see the screen, is garnished with a whole pizza, chicken wings, a Dagwood sandwich, a stack of onion rings, another Bloody Mary, and a sack of french fries. Don't forget the olives. Well, yeah, there's the pick, and there's probably a celery stalk in there someplace like it, like it should be. But, but you know, th think about this. It, it's impressive as heck, isn't it? But it has ceased to have a unique identity, right? It has ceased to be practical, focused, and coherent. You get something like that, you hardly know what to do with it. So there was a time when Charles thought that this movement, like that Bloody Mary, could be everything to everyone. Um, and then I think he realized that he needed to take a more focused approach because he didn't have enough lifetimes to learn all the things that he needed to learn to really master all of the things that he was, uh, he was putting out there in that publication of Modern Thought. So that led to the decision to stay grounded, home base in our Judeo-Christian culture. Charles thought, that the biggest mistake traditional Christian teachings made was to turn Jesus into a supernatural being. He thought if, if, if Jesus was a, a superhuman, 
with magical powers that are beyond those of mere mortals. If that was the case, then how is his life going to be any kind of a practical example to us mere mortals? So what Charles wanted to do was to show that there were natural explanations for the miracles that were attributed to Jesus in the Bible. Um, I have to say that he never really came up with anything that had a real sound basis in science, uh, but think about it. Charles was a product of the Victorian age. He was in his 60s when the work of Albert Einstein and others started to revolutionize our understanding of the world around us. So he did the best he could with what he had. Um, for example, another thing that he really believed was that people could actually learn how to regenerate their physical bodies, uh, which ended up being another failed hypothesis, at least for him. Um, he didn't get out alive, but he had a good sense of humor about the whole thing. That's the amazing thing, because he did, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't treat this as, uh, he didn't treat his ideas as something that were sacred and couldn't be touched. If it didn't work out, well, it didn't work out, and he moved on, you moved on to the next thing. Uh, he had a good sense of humor about this, and uh, I want to show you a brief audio clip. This is uh, from Charles Fillmore when he was 92 years old, and he was talking to an audience, and, and audiences would frequently ask him. They'd say things like, well, Mr. Fillmore, how's that regeneration thing going? Do you seem to be getting any younger, and this and that, and the other thing? And, and this just gives you an example of the way that, uh, the way that he dealt with those kind, of, uh, those kind of questions. So let's go ahead and play that. something new. <laughs> it's interesting because by this time for Charles, as I said, he was 92 years old. He only lived another year, so he had a pretty good idea that it wasn't quite working out the way that he had, uh, the way that he had hypothesized. Um, but by this time, it wasn't about anything physical. It was about your state of consciousness. That was the shift that was starting to happen. Okay, the face we see in the mirror is what it is, right? And it's not a reliable indicator of what's happening on the inside, you see. That's what was happening. It was the shift in consciousness that wasn't dependent on what's going on on the outside. Here's a picture of Charles when he was 93. Now, quite frankly, he looks to be about 93. And you can clearly see that he has that hip problem because of the way that he's standing. So that was, that was, uh, that was still that was still with him, um, and this was right around the time when Charles wrote what has now become a very famous affirmation. I think we have the original copy here that you can see in yes, the archives. Yes. Kind of hard to to make it out there, but here's here's the here's the print version where he said, "I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm and spring forth with a mighty faith to do what ought to be done by me." 93 years old, that was his state of consciousness. It had nothing to do with that mug that you see in the mirror that you want to be new because he was renewed in consciousness. No question about that. You really can't always control what happens to the body. Some form of sickness, old age, and death is inevitable, but that doesn't mean that we have to suffer. And that's been the message that we get going all the way back to the Greek Stoics and before that to the Buddhists 
and other philosophies around the world. Where Charles really succeeded was in bringing our interpretation of the life and teachings of Jesus back into alignment with those perennial ideas. Both Charles and Myrtle Fillmore had very clear ideas on the purpose or the meaning of life. And I think that's a major part of their success, this, this, this um, idea of the meaning of life. Here's what Charles had to say on the subject. He said, We sometimes think that we must succeed in some business or occupation before we can become rich and famous. This is missing the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which is to demonstrate the divine idea of a perfect man. The real object of life is not making money or becoming famous, but the building of character the bringing forth of the potentialities that exist in every one of us. Virtues, character, all of those things. It's not just about believing in miracles. It's not about believing in atonement or salvation. It's about emulating the way that Jesus lived the virtues of courage and justice and self-control and wisdom and things like that. Those are the things that made up what Charles called the Christ consciousness. Those things and more. And it's not just about Jesus because there are other spiritual and philosophical traditions that promote that same kind of consciousness. So, for those who are ready to move on from traditional Christianity and religion into a more secular and philosophical approach to spirituality, unity can serve as a bridge between the two. But that doesn't mean that anyone has to give up everything that went before it. For those who might be looking for a deeper and more meaningful interpretation of their Christian culture, unity does that too. It's all about drawing together the best of what our spiritual and philosophical traditions have to offer. And we do that in order to bring about greater human flourishing, or thriving as we put it here. And the best thing about it is that you don't have to believe anything unless there's sufficient evidence. That makes it a work in progress. Charles Fillmore got the ball rolling, he got some things wrong, but most of all, he got it right when he said we don't need to believe anything that we cannot logically demonstrate to be true, and that it all starts with our own individual human consciousness, and that's where the focus needs to be. See you next week.